Hello, thank you, Andrew, so much for having me here. This is an amazing conference, and you're right that this is like bringing the brain to the gym. The problem is that I am not used, and my head is full of lactic acid, and it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> and Claire, don't worry about your time. I'll make my talk shorter, and you will be able to purchase some uh, uh, speaking credits. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to continue on the issue of memory that Claire started. And we have a problem of perception. Our perception of the ocean is so biased, and this is destroying it. And let me use an analogy. Imagine that you are an alien, and that you come to Earth the first time on your spaceship, and you land on a junkyard. And there you have it, in front of you, the first car you've ever seen. It's a piece of garbage rusty, the engine doesn't work, but the battery still has some juice. So if you push a button, there are those two black things that move and clean the, the windshield. So you get your grant from the Interplanetary Science Foundation and the Interplanetary Geographic Society, and you determine that the car is something that allows you to contemplate the landscape sitting comfortably, even when it rains, because you, there are the two, these two things that clean the windshield. <laughs> right? This is our perception of the ocean. We have been studying reefs, coral reefs, kelp forest, uh, you name it, marine ecosystems. Modern science began long after we started degrading these ecosystems. Now, if I come and tell you, you are the alien like me, right? And uh, this thing, this car can take you from here to New York. You're going to say, come on, you are speculating, you have no experimental proof. Do you have any statistical design to do this? Well, this is marine science. This is what my colleagues were, would tell me if I told them that. So we have a problem here. This is a cartoon that depicts the trajectory of coral reefs from pristine, before humans, where the coral reefs were full of corals, sharks, crocodiles, manatees, turtles, big fish, clean water, and this is Jakarta Bay. It's a soup of microbes and slime and jellyfish, right? 99.9% .9 of all studies conducted on coral reefs have happened between here and there. 99.9% .9 of the science of what we know about coral reefs from here to there, right? In this junkyard, the car doesn't have an instruction manual, right? And we don't have an instruction manual for marine ecosystems. So if you want to really want if you really want to know how the car works, what do you do? You go to a dealership and get a brand new car, and then you'll be able to understand what the car is for. Well, this is why I, I this is why what I have been doing. I've been going to coral reef dealerships, to places that are on this side of, of the gradient, pristine places, remote, uninhabited, and fished coral reefs. So what I'm going to do is well, Dan Gilbert was talking this morning about our perception of risk and how we are unable to perceive risk, uh, to perceive uh, something that happens uh, slowly. So what I'm going to do is to compress time. Now we're going to jump on a time machine and I'm going to take you from a normal reef, as most of the reefs you can find today, to a reef that is like the reefs that we had 500 years ago. To do this, I led an expedition to the Line Islands, a remote archipelago in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And this archipelago has a, the perfect experimental situation. With one reef, Kingman Reef, uninhabited, Palmyra Atoll, 10 people at the most. They are employed by the Nature Conservancy and the US Fish and Wildlife Service. This place is protected. Tabuairan or Fanning, 2,500 people, and Christmas Atoll, 5,000 people. So what I'm going to do is to take you from Christmas, which is the present of coral reefs, to Kingman Reef, to the past. Christmas is one of the largest coral atolls in the world, 75 kilometers in length. This place 
was discovered by Captain Cook on Christmas Day, 1777. And he well, he was famous for being a very accurate British sailor. He was not uh, prone to hyperbole. And he wrote in his diary that the lagoon is filthy with sharks. The sharks came and beat the oars and the rudder of our small boats while we were uh, rowing ashore. In 2005, we did 250 hours of diving. How many sharks do you think we see? None. 250 hours of diving, no sharks. There is a patch there on the, upper on the upper left, the entrance to the lagoon. Now they are setting nets and catching the last manta rays, the last sharks. And this is the, great, the largest fishery. Flame angelfish, about this big, to feed the US and Asia aquarium market. You'll see photos from this coral reef and from other places by these famous photographers showing all this diversity, biodiversity, all these animals, all these little fish and little crabs. Most of the fishes in Christmas are smaller than the pencil that I use to count them. Most of them. A coral reef is a coral reef because it has corals. Many reefs around the world, like Christmas, are not coral reefs anymore. They are a dead coral reef covered by algae and bacteria. If the algae overgrow the corals, the corals don't grow anymore, and the reef doesn't protect the shore against erosion, and it doesn't provide all this habitat for the fish, etc., etc. So this is bad. A coral reef shouldn't have algae. A coral reef has lots of corals. Most of the Caribbean is like this, unfortunately. Now we go 50 years in the past, 100 years in the past, Tabueran which means in the Ikiribas language, heavenly footprint. It's a beautiful atoll, perfect atoll, and you dive there, and wow, yes, there are some living corals. Look at this beautiful green algae, right? And all of these fishes. You see these photos. This could be the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. People pay a lot of money to go diving in places like this. And they come back and, wow, it's great. If the first time you dive on a coral reef, you dive here, you're going to say, wow, it was fantastic. All these fishes, all these small fishes, full of colors and everything. Problem, the corals die because of disease, global warming, and algae. Here we have only a small turf of algae, it's not as bad as Christmas, but the algae overgrow the corals, and that's it, the corals don't come back. Palmyra, only 10 people. The, uh, this reef has been fished for sharks, for shark finning until the late 90s, but now it's protected by the Fish and Wildlife Service. We saw sea turtles in almost every dive. Sharks, finally, we were so happy, Alan, Freeland, and I, because we finally saw sharks in our accounts. But look at all this dead coral. This platform here, this plate, was a huge coral plate, maybe 200 years old, that died and capsized. The good news is that, unlike Christmas and Fanning, there are small corals coming back here. But still, the corals are not as abundant as before. And finally, we'll go to Kingman Reef. Remember, the first day, Chris uh, told us about this uh, arousal uh, sensor. If I had I had an arousal sensor, there would be a huge peak among, uh, above uh, Kingman Reef. This place is a pristine reef that has never been fished, and it's corals everywhere. You don't see large seaweed here. This is a new species of coral, new to science. It's huge. No scientist had seen it previously. A single colony of a, to a totally new a species of coral. This is probably 500 years old. When Columbus was in Spain or Genova or whatever, planning his expedition to the, to the New World, there was a small coral larva, about two millimeters in diameter, that went down to the bottom, settled, and started growing. You don't find these monsters, these dinosaurs, almost anywhere else in the world. The lagoon is so pristine that the bottom is paved with giant clams of all different colors. They filter water. The oysters have the natural millipore filter. There are so many, more than 10 per square meter in some places. They filter the water so perfectly that we detected here, we measured the lowest concentration of bacteria and viruses in any coral reef anywhere in the world. And predators. When the first, this is a red snapper. And these guys beat my ponytail, the photographer's earlobe, the videographers, uh, they are very curious animals. <laughs> That's a new euphemism, of course. And 
these animals had, when we went in 2005, we dove for the first time on the windward side of this reef, no, these animals had seen no humans before. And diving in Kingman Reef is a unique experience. I felt what Darwin must have felt when he stepped on the Galapagos for the first time. The animals don't run away from you. They come to check you out. These guys also check if you taste good. <laughs> and as soon as you, I remember the first dive. We were on the, on the small boat, very, very excited, because after one and a half years of preparation and five years of uh, expedition, we reached our destination, Kingman Reef, the pristine reef, this time machine that will transport us to the past. And I jump in the water, I turn around, and when the bubbles clear, my heartbeat doubled. Sharks, there were 15 sharks around me. <laughs> These snappers, they eat from sea urchins to giant clams to other fish, and there are sharks in every dive. We have feeding. In the Caribbean, if you want to see sharks, you have to feed them, you have to chum them. Here, there are sharks in every dive between 20 and 25, 10 and 25. And there are so many predators. This place is so unique that the entire food web is upside down. This is what we were told in school. If you think about the African plains, one pound of lion needs 10 pounds of wildebeest, and one pound of wildebeest needs 10 pounds of grass, because assimilation of energy from our prey is not very efficient. This is why there are no tigers and lions in small islands, because there is not enough room for the primary production for the plants that is going to feed the, the herbivores, the prey of the carnivores, etc. This might be true for the land, but in the sea, this is characteristic only of degraded reefs. But in textbooks, this is what you find. And this is a consequence of studying reefs that have been degraded. Kingman Reef is like this. The pyramid is upside down. Top predators, mostly these red snappers and the sharks, account for 85% of the total fish biomass. We're talking about more than five tons of fish per hectare. You put two soccer fields together, and there are five tons of fish there. And 85% is top predators, and 60% is sharks. This is, imagine the African plains, imagine the Serengeti with five pounds of lion per pound of zebra and wildebeest. This is a pristine reef. Is the pristine reef perfect everywhere? Of course not. In a, in a reef that is life and death, we found some starfishes, crown of thorn starfishes, eating the corals. The white patch on the left is dead coral. It, this is natural. And there are predators. This l large triton snail, which is a foot and a half, is the natural predator of the, of the starfish. You can see there the starfish being eaten by the triton. And these guys has, have a stomach that is tougher than the Mexicans. <laughs> Really. I put my, my finger un, no, unwillingly on top of one, and it still hurts. That was a month ago. That white patch up there is a mushroom coral that probably was the last dinner of that starfish. And this thing, this round thing here, is a dead coral plate that is covered by small corals that are recolonizing. So there is life and death on a pristine reef. But even if there is uh, global warming that kills the coral or disease or whatever, the corals come back. So what have we done? We have removed everything that is large and that we like, the large fish, large invertebrates, and we have reduced the biomass. But the interesting thing is that we have increased the abundance of fish. We have, on the pristine reef, we have less fish, and they are larger, and we have much more biomass. On a degraded reef, we have more fishes per square meter, but they are smaller. Of course, if you have more fishes, statistically, it's very likely that you are going to have more species. So on a degraded reef, Christmas has more biodiversity than Kingman. People have been focusing on just number of species, number of species, this is good. But a reef with lots of species doesn't necessarily need to be mature and complex. We need to get biomass into the picture too. We have capsized the food web. We have replaced or helped replace corals with algae. And we have enhanced the domination of microbes. And we have also reduced the resi resilience. The resilience is what we scientists call the, the ability of the ecosystem to recover after a disturbance, such as a global war a warming event or overfishing. And reefs that are pristine, that have all the components, are more resilient. They can stand better global warming. On land, the same thing happens. After the introduction of wolves in Yellowstone, 
that the year population stopped fluctuating like crazy. It's stable now, and the forest is coming back. Same thing here. We still don't know the exact mechanism, but I don't care. Scientists can go there and do all the experiments, my colleagues, but it is clear when you go from degraded to pristine, a system that is intact recovers. A system that is not intact, where the predators are missing, doesn't recover, period. How many Kingman reefs are there? On the way back, on the, uh, we did two expeditions there, partly funded by National Geographic Society. On the 2005, we visited the, four, the five northern line islands. In 2007, this month of August, we went to Kingman Reef, and we spent three weeks there and studied the entire ecosystem from the microbes to the sharks with a team of scientists, from microbiologists to fish biologists, from the shallow lagoon to the deeper reef of, um, of, uh, accessible with uh, scuba diving. And in 2005, when I came back, the last place I, I had seen was Kingman Reef. And I was paradise. I was in paradise. I was so amazed and, and happy. And I came back and I flew from Honolulu to Los Angeles and we landed at night and I could see the monster, right? 10,000 square kilometers of concrete and, and lights. And I was thinking, well, you know, how many Kingman Reefs are there? If now we took Kingman Reef, which is only 20 kilometers long, and dropped it in LA, from the plane probably I couldn't see it. You know, how many Kingman Reefs are there? And why is, it in, why is it important to go to these places, to these pristine places? Well, first we need to know what our baselines are. What can the car do, right? This will help us also understand what has been our global impact. What have we lost along the way? And also to determine what do we want for the future. Are we happy with the few corals and the little fishes from fanning, or we want something more? And also, there is a, a need, we humans have a need for experiencing nature that is not human dominated firsthand. This is what E.O. Wilson calls biophilia, this sense of awe and wonder that we can only experience in nature. And the only thing that gets close to this is love, and at least in my opinion. <laughs> and also there is something spiritual going to a pristine place like this. When you think about that, the saline solution in the placenta and seawater is about the same concentration. And going to these reefs or bringing these reefs to people, these reefs that are, remind us of the times where humans was ju were just a dream to our childhood, I, I think this is a, pro a process of rejuvenation. I think it's a healing process. So how many Kingman reefs are there? One of the goals of uh, um, the future, our future projects are to find the last pristine places in the ocean, not only coral reefs, bring them to the people, study them on a snapshot way, t t uh, similar to what we did before. We bring a team of scientists, we study the ecosystem from the microbes to the sharks. We bring policymakers, and we will try to get them protected. One example is the Southern Line Islands. It's south of the, of the equator between Christmas Reef and French Polynesian. There are six islands there, Flint, very small, Vostok, only half a square kilometer in size, Millennium Atoll, Malden, 36 square kilometers, Starbuck, no coffee shop there yet, um, Jarvis, Jarvis belongs to the US, it's a wildlife, national wildlife refuge, the others belong to the Republic of the Kiribati. So in 2009, we're going to do a six week expedition visiting all these places. But next year in March, we are going to spend 10 days at Millennium Atoll, which is only 400 miles north of Tahiti. And we're going to try a pilot project of, with conservation, um, Limblet Expeditions and National Geographic Society, what we call conservation expeditions. We're going to, these places, we're going to find the last pristine places, bring a number of paying guests, policy makers, media, and we're going to produce magazine articles, documentaries, and start, we want to start a new ecotourism formula where exclusive trips to these very remote places are going to help create an endowment that is going to substitute the fishing fees that these governments get uh, from their water. So we hope that tourism is actually going to save these places as opposed to what mass tourism has, has done in other places, including Spain. And 
Now, the challenge now is to go from pristine, sorry, the cha I don't know if you noticed, but there on the top, well, so here you see the jellyfish, the slime, and on the top there are a bunch of people that look really burned on the beach like this. So we want to go from, he from there to there because we know that the farther we are from the right, the better we'll be. Thank you.